this lesson, we're going to get into some of the basics on financing. So let's first talk about the borrower's motivations. Why do borrowers use financing? Well, of course, the first one is that most, most people would not be able to buy a home unless they used financing. The amount of cash buyers has always been scarce. So financing is critical for people to be able to buy homes. Second reason why a buyer or borrower might use financing is for what's called leverage. Leverage is using other people's money to increase your rate of return. And there's Archimedes right there, you know, the Greek thinker, kind of a skinny guy. And Archimedes, if you recall, said, give me a lever long enough and I can lift the world. In other words, I can use less of my own strength to accomplish the same task. So here's an example. Let's say you purchase the property for $100,000, cash money, and you sold it sometime thereafter for $110,000. So you made a $10,000 profit, pretty good. So, but you invested $100,000, so your profit on that was 10%. Not bad, depends upon how long you might have owned that property. So how about now using leverage where you got a $90,000 loan, a 90% loan? Well, that property still cost you $100,000, but you only put 10% down and you sold it for $110,000. So you made the same profit of $10,000. But how much was your original investment? only 10,000 out of your pocket, so your rate of return on your cash investment was 100%. Now I know you're gonna say, well, gee whiz, you know, there's interest on the loan and so on. Well, that's true, but still your profit can be enhanced substantially by using leverage properly. A leverage is also a double-edged sword. If the property value went down, which did happen in 2007, 8, 9, 10, 11, etc., uh, then leverage can be negative. So the use of leverage needs to be uh, done wisely. Third motivation for borrowers is that interest is tax deductible. Now, I'm preparing this lesson here in 2017 when there's actually talk about removing or reducing the interest deduction on home mortgages. At the present time, it's not. And I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that in all likelihood, it's not going to be changed or changed very much. So the, the interest being deductible on your federal and state income taxes actually lessens your monthly payment from an after-tax perspective. So three reasons why borrowers like to use financing. Number one, to buy the home. Number two, for leverage. Number three, the interest is tax deductible. How about a lender? Why do lenders like to use real estate as security for loans? Well, the first reason is a relatively high yield, high rate of return, because it's thought to be a relatively safe investment. Although a lot of lenders found out that that was not so true back uh, in the 2008, 9, 10 period. But a high yield compared to what? Well, typically real estate mortgages are looked upon as being safe long-term investments. And the benchmark U.S. security that relates to mortgage interest rates is the 10-year U.S. Treasury bond. If you track that 10-year U.S. Treasury bond and, and how the interest rates or yields increase and decrease, uh, what you'll see is mortgage interest rates, generally speaking, follow those increases and decreases. Also, lenders feel it's low risk with good security. That is if they make smart loans. And it's no question that back in the early 2000s, uh, leading up to the mortgage meltdown, that lenders made a lot of stupid loans. They made loans where they didn't have to qualify the buyer where they, they were called stated income no-doc loans, where the buyer could state whatever income they want and they didn't require documentation. Uh, but that's pretty stupid. But if the lender makes sure the buyer is well qualified, that's a low-risk loan and real property is then going to be good security. 
How about you as a licensee? What's your motivation? Well, your motivation is, number one, to help this buyer get their home or help your seller sell their home. Uh, and there's a lot of personal satisfaction in so doing. Of course, you're in business. So uh, the more uh, you understand about financing, the more you can help those buyers and sellers and the more transactions you can close. Let's take a few minutes and talk about the documents, the instruments uh, dealing with financing. And the two documents we're going to talk about are the promissory note and the mortgage. Please realize when you go to closing and, and finance a property, the borrower is signing two documents, the promissory note and the mortgage. So uh, one of the questions I oftentimes ask in class is how many of you have ever signed an unsecured promissory note? And very few people actually raise their hand. And then I tell them, well, most of you probably have but didn't realize it because what this is, this credit card, really is an unsecured promissory note to the credit card company. They don't call it a note. They call it an installment loan agreement or some other thing. But really what you're signing when you apply for and obtain a credit card is a promissory note. So the promissory note is the evidence of the debt. It's the IOU. It says IOU a million dollars. And it specifies who the lender and the borrower are, the parties. It specifies the amount of the debt, a million bucks. It specifies the interest rate, 4%, 20%, whatever it might be. And it specifies the payments and the pattern of payments, monthly payments of so many dollars. So that's what the promissory note contains. The note, however, is rarely, if ever, and we'll say the note is not recorded at the county recorder's office. What's recorded is the mortgage. Now, in Arizona, we actually use deeds of trust or trust deeds instead of mortgages, but I'm using the term mortgage here as a very generic term. So the mortgage is the lien instrument on the property. In one of the Arizona discussions, we will get into what deeds of trust are in a lot of detail. So the mortgage is actually what it does is hypothecates the property as collateral. That's a new term for you. This term hypothecate or hypothecation. To hypothecate something means to put it up as security, but you keep possession of it. So if you've ever financed your car, who's driving around in your car? You or the bank? Well, obviously you are. So you hypothecated your car, you named it as collateral, but you kept possession. Same thing with a house or other real property. You name that property as collateral to the bank, but you keep possession. So you've hypothecated it. And that's what the mortgage does. It names the property as collateral, allowing you to keep possession. And that mortgage document contains a number of provisions in it, which uh, ultimately would allow the lender to foreclose if you did not make your payments on the promissory note. So the promissory note and mortgage are tied together. Please realize the mortgage is the document that contains the legal description of the property. The mortgage describes the collateral. The note does not describe the collateral. The mortgage describes the collateral. So it states the legal description of the property and the mortgage is the document that is recorded to establish the lien priority. And we talk about lien priorities in another lesson. Now let's talk about different payment plans that you might have on a loan. And the first and by far the most common is called the fully amortized loan or fully amortized payment plan. The word amortize means to kill off. The word mort is a Latin or French word meaning death. So a fully amortized loan is a loan that is fully paid off over time. And this is by far the most common type. And in a fully amortized loan, you have level payments of both principal, P, and interest, I. So that every month or every quarter or every year, you have a, the same exact payment time after time until the loan is paid down to zero. Let's take an example with a monthly payment. A $50,000 loan, 12% interest with monthly payments for 30 years 
We want to calculate what the monthly payment will be. We want to calculate the principal and interest portion of that payment for the first three months, and then the remaining balance after the first three months. So first and foremost, the monthly payment. Well, actually, you and I, in all likelihood, uh, certainly I couldn't. I don't have the math background. I have a pretty good math background, but not enough to do that. There's a rather complicated equation with a square root and some other things in it to actually calculate the level payment on a fully amortized loan. But the way we in the real estate profession do this is one of two ways, typically, using a monthly payment table. Now, I know you can't see that table. You have a, a, a simple example in your course material. Uh, but on this particular loan, what you would do is you would go to the 12% page and you would go across the top to the 30-year column and then run your finger down to where it said $50,000 and that would be the monthly payment. And that is 514.31. But more commonly, real estate professionals use a financial calculator that has the, the software in it to calculate the payment. So what you would do here is you would put the loan amount, the $50,000 into the loan amount key, and the 12% into the interest rate key, and the 30-year term into the term key, and you'd press payment, and it would calculate the payment to be, in this example, five fourteen thirty one. So now that we know what our payment is, and again, on the, on the state exam, you're not going to be asked to do this. If, if a math question give, uh, it comes up, where you're asked to find the principal and interest, they would tell you what the full level monthly payment of principal and interest is in the question. So now let's find the interest principal and remaining balances. Here's how you do it, and I want you to keep this process in mind. Follow along here. You take the original principal balance, which in this case is $50,000, and you multiply that by the annual interest rate, 12% in our example, and that gives you the annual interest, which in this case is $6,000. But we're going to make a monthly payment. We're going to make a payment after one month, so we only owe a month's interest when the payment comes due. So we divide that annual interest by 12 months, and we get the first month's interest of $500. So that's part answer to our question here. The monthly interest is $500. Now, Interestingly enough here, I've used 12% as our rate, and since there are 12 months in a year, the monthly interest then would always be 1% on a 12% interest rate loan. What if it was 6%, what would it be? Right, it would be one half of 1%, or in this example, $250. So we found the monthly interest. Now the total payment which was given to us 51431 principal and interest. We now subtract the monthly interest from that of $500. That gives us the principal portion of the payment, which is in the first month, is $14.31. Wow. So $500 of the 51431 goes to interest and only $14.31 to principal. And that's the way it is on a 30 year fully amortized loan. Uh, the large portion of the early payments go to interest, not to principal. In fact, on a 30-year fully amortized loan, it takes about 22 and a half years to cut the principal balance in half. So now let's find the remaining balance. With a beginning balance of $50,000 and the principal portion being only $14.31, that gives us a remaining balance at the end of month one of 49,985.69. And now, with this balance as our new balance, we would then begin this process over again for months two and three. And you have examples of that in your course material, so I won't do it here on the screen. But look that over, because being able to calculate the interest in the principal on a loan is not only important for the test, but uh, you might want to do it for yourself or for one of your clients. The next type of payment that we want to talk about is a balloon payment. And a balloon payment is simply a large payment made maybe at some point in the middle of the loan or at the end of the loan. So in other words, you might have a loan which is 
where the payment is calculated as if it was fully amortized, 30 years. But the note might say the entire remaining principal balance will become due and payable after 10 years. So at, at the end of 10 years, you owe the remaining balance. That's called a balloon payment. The next type of payment plan is called a budget loan or a budget payment. This is where not only do you pay principal and interest owed to the lender, but you also pay taxes and insurance. You include in your payment the property taxes for each month and the, and the insurance premium for each month. And this goes into what is commonly called an escrow account or an impound account or reserve account. The exam will most likely call it an escrow account. Here in Arizona, we commonly call it, call it an impound account or reserve account. So each month, not only do you pay your principal and interest owed to the lender, but you pay uh, one month's worth of taxes and one month's worth of insurance. And I highly recommend that most buyers uh, make their payments on a budget plan. Why? Simply because of the fact most people will not be able to accumulate the amount of money to pay the taxes and the insurance when that comes due. So making it part of the monthly payment is, is a much safer way for the borrower to make sure that they do not have to come up with a couple of thousand dollars to pay the taxes or the insurance on the property. Another type of loan payment is a straight loan or an interest-only loan or what's called a term loan. A straight loan is simply one where you only make interest payments. No principal is paid down on the loan. Now, these loans are usually short-term, and in real estate, we commonly find them with construction loans. Imagine a builder building a house to be finished in a year and hopefully find a buyer for that house. The builder doesn't want to pay principal payments, so the builder will make an arrangement with the bank to pay interest-only payments on the loan and then pay the loan off when the property sells and the buyer puts on a 30-year fully amortized loan. The next one is called a negatively amortized loan or a negative amortization. And this is a loan in which actually the payments are not even sufficient to pay the amount of interest that's due. So the unpaid interest gets added to the principal, becomes principal, and the loan balance continues to increase over time. Now these are not common today at all because interest rates have been very low. But in the 1980s when interest rates reached 16, 17 percent, I, we saw these commonly, and the way they were arranged was that every year the payment would increase. And over a six or seven year period, the payment became sufficient, the monthly payment uh, became sufficient to finally amortize that loan down and pay down the principal. Negative amortizations. Please note, the pattern of payments, in other words, the monthly payment, the amount, whether it's monthly, quarterly, etc., are always found in the promissory note, not in the mortgage document. In addition, please realize that loan payments, mortgage payments, are always made in arrears. In other words, interest is always paid in arrears. So when you make a payment on July 1st, that payment is not for the month of July, but for the month of June. You make your payment on August 1st, that payment is for the month of July, not for the month of August. So interest payments are always made in arrears on loans. So that's our basic discussion on financing. In another lesson, we're going to get into a number of the different types of loans like FHA and VA, as well as a lot of clauses that are found in loans.